So do you know where this is? Epcot, right? Where is it? Is it open back way? Anybody know? It's open back up? Great. So what does EPCOT stand for? Anybody know that acronym EPCOT? I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. The Experimental Community of Tomorrow. The Experimental Community of Tomorrow. So when you go there, you can see some, some futuristic things as well as uh, villages of the world. And Michael Slaughter talked about going to Florida probably not long after Disney Road and Epcot opened and walking into the beginning and seeing that huge icon of Epcot and looking at the words Epcot, the experimental community of tomorrow. And he found himself asking this question of himself. Isn't that what the church is called to be? The experimental community of tomorrow. Today. Isn't that what we're called to be? Isn't that what we have been empowered to be? Because if Jesus lives in us, shouldn't there be something different about us? Because if Jesus lives in us, shouldn't people we engage every day see both our humanness and, and yet the grace and over a period of time seeing a different kind of response in us? An engagement of the principalities and powers because of this faith that, that is... It is light inside of us. If Jesus is alive in us, shouldn't that affect how others see us in the church, but not just in relating to the world, but also how we relate to one another? Shouldn't that light make a difference in us? And I just love that, the experimental community of tomorrow. And I think that's what the church should be in our best, in our best. And let's strive for excellence in our best, that we ought to be the kind of community that God anticipates us that we can be and become. And then we come to times and seasons like what we're in right now in this election season and we ask this question, you know, how do we engage in this very difficult election seasons when passions are so easily aroused and aroused in fear? Well, fear feels like sometimes like it takes the upper hand. Or as the statement in the bulletin says, how entering this election season do we live together on different sides of the aisle? Because I know in this room, there are people on different, more than one side of an aisle, probably more than one aisle. Now, what helps me sometimes to, to remember who I'm supposed to be in the middle of a season just like this is a Facebook post from John Wesley that someone quoted to John Wesley a while back, and, and I remind myself what John Wesley... Now, John Wesley, you remember from last week, was the, United, the founder of the Methodist movement. He never intended to to find and found a church, but it kind of the life spirit took life on its own. And, and John Wesley was basically kicked out of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, that's the Episcopals on the English side of the Atlantic, because he felt that the good news of God's love in Jesus shouldn't just be restricted to boundaries and parishes, it should be for all the world. He was the one that said the world is our parish and calls us to that same life-giving proclamation and representation. And, and what he says is, you know, I met those of our society, and he divided the people who responded to his movement into societies and then classes and then bands going from larger groups to smaller groups. And a society is those who had voted in the ensuing election, and he advised them to vote without fee or reward, without bribery, which happened a lot back then, for the person they judged most worthy to speak no evil of the person they voted against, and to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. He was saying, if we want to be the body of Christ, that these are important guidelines, good advice for me, for others, probably not enough. But what I think is at the heart of Wesley's advice is a reminder that as followers of Jesus, that we are to remember that we are as much or maybe more citizens of the kingdom of God as much as we are citizens of this amazing, amazing country which is resilient in ways we don't even see sometimes.
You are the people of God, Paul wrote to a community in Colossae of Christians. He loved you and he chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another. Whenever any of you have a complaint against someone else, you must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all of these qualities, Paul continues, add love, which binds the binding agent, all of these things together in perfect unity. And then he concludes with this in the third chapter, chapter seven, verse 17. Everything you do or say should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you do or say should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's what he's saying. If, if we who have been touched by the grace of Christ, if we find ourselves in all of life's difficulties and challenges as followers of Jesus, that how we act, what we say, what we don't say, what we do, what we don't do, how we treat others is we're representing the name of Jesus. And so they're going to see possibly what Jesus is like through us. So how we act reflects on the name of Jesus. And shouldn't that affect how we live? with people who agree with us, and especially the people who disagree with us. The gospel, it affects the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus is the good news that the kingdom of God has come. And where the Holy Spirit moves, where the presence of Christ begins to disturb us and touch us and enliven us and, and lure us and call us, then the kingdom of God is beginning to, to emerge in our very presence, in our merry bits. Where Jesus is, there the kingdom is unfolding. And, and Jesus said, where the kingdom is, the kingdom is redemptive movement of God to bring good news to the poor and the recovery of sight to the blind to the release of the captives and to set the oppressed free and oppression and, and blindness and captivity is not just physical, is it? Sometimes it's spiritual, isn't it? Sometimes it's emotional, captivity and oppression. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's psychological. And where the kingdom is moving and people are being set free, it's emerging. And people like you and me. And the church, the Greek word ecclesia, the called out ones, the church's mission is to function as God's redemptive community in the world, reclaiming the lost, rebuilding the broken, and re restoring God's desire for God's created order. But that's hard to do when our ideology surpasses our theology, when our politics surpasses the call we have to represent the image of Jesus in the world. See, in the early church, their biggest wrestle, their biggest conflict was not about politics, not about whether you supported Caesar or didn't support Caesar. It was about whether you even counted whether we even mattered in the movement of God, whether you even were counted among the people of God, because their biggest conflict was about whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, whether you were part of God's people called out by God, or whether you were part of the rest of the world. And Paul remembers those quotes from Isaiah where God has called his people to be a light to the nations. And he remembers Peter's encounter with the Spirit of God as God tells Peter, Peter who wanted to exclude the people who weren't Jews because they weren't part of the people or weren't practicing the right things, the right religion, that God sent this, this sheet of all kinds of food for him to eat. And God said, you know what? Those who I include, don't exclude and that was the movement of the Spirit to all the world are included in God's movement. But they still had this battle. They still had this division, two sides of the aisle in their own church about who was in and who was out, who counted and who didn't count. And so to a church divided, to a church divided about what really counts, about who is redeemed, 
about people wrestling how do we live together with someone who sits on the other side of the aisle. This is what Paul writes. Second, excuse me, Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies with his own body on the cross. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself, in this way making peace. By his death on the cross, he destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body, and he brought them back to God. So Christ came and preached the good news of peace to all, to you Gentiles who were far away from God and to the Jews who were near to him. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, were able to come in the one spirit into the presence of the Father. What are the bonds that divide us, that put us on separate sides? Paul says, it is your commitment to the way of Jesus that brings us into that peace. That is our peace. Our commitment to Jesus, to the way of Jesus, that is the peace. And so, as long as our ideology surpasses our theology, then we lose that distinctive Christian voice in the world. And we sound more like a political party than we do the people of God, the body of Christ who represent Jesus. As long as our ideology surpasses our theology, we lose our distinctive prophetic voice about how this world should be created and shaped in a way that adds to the common good for all of God's people. If we ideology surpasses our theology, our belief in Christ, first of all, then we are asking Jesus, get this, we are asking Jesus to conform to our worldview rather than being transformed by Jesus' worldview. He is our peace. In his body, he breaks down the dividing wall. Our identity is in Christ first. We are called to be the kingdom of God first. And our theology needs to surpass our ideology. Now, there is no doubt in my mind Christians should be involved in the political process that we should be supporting and engaging with candidates that we believe represent a policy that we believe our best for our common life together. That as followers of Jesus, we may need to filter that through the ministry and life of Jesus, the teaching of the church, but we should be involved. We should be voting. It's our civic duty. It's what we're called to do in order to elect people who may best represent us and move forward policies. And, and the reality is we live in a day and age when, when I would say first that we ought to hopefully be electing people whose, whose character demonstrate a sense of decency and goodness, but we know that's not always the case in our election. So we should always be looking for people whose policies, whose words and policies more closely match up and whose policies may, in our best estimation, create the most common good for the most of us, to be the best for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. And I'll guarantee you we'll do that and we'll disagree on who that should be and who that policy, what that policy should be. But if the Spirit of Christ is in us, our primary focus is on manifesting the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean all of a sudden, oh, we'll be changed. We'll be able to sing Kumbaya like it was meant to be sang and dance in a circle and all will be good. We'll still have disagreements, but we can disagree and listen. We can speak our point of view and hear the other's point of view because here's what I know about my life. I do not have the answers to everything. And in fact, there's a tendency, there's studies that show you, there's a tendency to simplify the answers to what are undoubtedly complex problems. And when we oversimplify, we tend to gravitate too, too easily. But I know I don't have the answer, so I want to listen 
to where you're coming from, your point of view. I want to listen to what you think the Spirit may be saying to you because I don't have the answers. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we look through the glass dimly, which means, man, we don't know it all. But we need to be focused on what Jesus is calling us to be first. Michael Slaughter says the chief concern of the church of Jesus will not just to get some people some disembodied heaven, but his chief purpose was to redeem people for the purpose of getting heaven's resources and God's saving purposes into the earth. I like that. That's the call of the people who follow Jesus in all of our differences. In all of our differences. So how do we do that? How shall we live in this room when we feel differently about the election? I think we engage people by honoring our differences to know that there will be differences. That Paul writes about different gifts in the body of Christ in more than one occasion. And he says, you know, we need to honor those differences because none of us see everything exactly perfectly. We need to be able to listen. And we can do that in a more healthy and less anxious way than we declared that our desire is not to win, but our desire is to see the resources of God and God's saving purposes get into the world. And lastly, as follow of Jesus, let's take Jesus' commandments seriously. Jesus said Christians will be known not by our ability to draw lines between themselves and those whom they disagree, not by our ability to hold true opinions on all the matters. He said Jesus will be known by their love for one another, quite apart from whether we agree with each other. Now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And that love, that word love is agape. And, and that's, that's not like friendly love. That's not like hanging out with your family love. That is unconditional, God-given grace that extends your heart beyond your normal boundaries and comfort zones. And, and scripture might even imply that it takes the work of God moving through the Holy Spirit to help us get that place. When was the last time you asked God's Holy Spirit to help you love your enemy? That you may manifest God's agape love. Now next week in the part two of this, I'm going to deal with the question of, okay, so I have a lot invested in this election, Mike, and it, it makes me afraid if my candidate does not win because the other candidate scares me or candidates. How do I love when I fear what can happen if my candidate doesn't win?